Galatians chapter 5, we'll read verse 1, and then we will open in prayer. All right, the Bible says here, Galatians 5 and verse 1, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come to you this morning, Lord, I thank you so much uh, for your word, for your goodness to us, for, uh, Lord, for this country that you've given us to live in. Lord, I thank you for what you've done, what you've, how you've used this country, Lord, and, and, and your people uh, through, through that, uh, down through the years to spread and to, uh, to preach the gospel. Lord, I pray that your hand would be upon us even today, and Lord, I pray that you'd draw us back unto yourself. And Lord, I pray that uh, you would just do a work in our midst. Lord, I pray that you'd be with me this morning as I preach this message. And Lord, I pray that you give me the words to say. Lord, I pray that you would just uh, guide me and direct me through this message. And Lord, help me uh, in, in, in my weakness to preach this. Lord, I pray that your hand would be upon us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. <clears throat> Today, July 4th, 2021, we celebrate 245 years since the signing uh, of the Declaration of Independence. You know that I remember the bicentennial when I was a little boy. Anybody, any of you remember the bicentennial? Uh, 200 years. It's hard to believe uh, that in just five years, right? In just five years, we're going to be celebrating 250 years uh, as a country. It's just uh, when you start to get older in life, and I know that some of you just, you know, you've experienced this. Um, Scott and Roger, you guys, is, you're used to it by now, right? But when you start to be able to look back 40 or 50 years, this is like, oh, my land. Uh, I, I can't even believe that that's possible yet, right? Um, 250 years is coming up, but 245 years since the birth of, I believe, the greatest nation on earth. Okay, there is no nation in the world like the United States of America. Now, you know, <clears throat> when I was growing up and even through my young life and into adult life, I was absolutely super patriotic. And I, I, I used to wonder, how do other people get excited about their country? Because, I mean, I just I just looked at them like... You guys are, are, are so, you all wish that you could be Americans, right? I, I, really, I really, really believe that. I believe that this is the greatest nation, and I still do believe that. But when, when we went down to Bolivia, South America, I found out that Bolivian people are super proud and super patriotic people. They have a, a love for their nation. And I think it's natural for, for people to love the country that they're born into and to have a, an and to have a, a desire to see it do better and everything. And, and, and so you might think that the United, for me saying that the United States is the greatest nation on earth, that, that maybe that's just a little bit of, of patriotic prejudice, right? But really, I do believe that this is the greatest nation on earth. Look at the way God has blessed this nation. Look at the way God has used this nation and its people and how it has prospered. It is no mistake that we are as prosperous as we are. It is the blessing of God. I have, I have no doubt about that. Uh, the country of Bolivia, arguably one of the poorest nations in the world. Okay, second poorest nation in the Western Hemisphere, okay, behind Nicaragua. All right, um, but it has been blessed with some of the richest natural resources in all of the world. It had gold, it had silver, it has uranium, it has oil, it has gas. It is just mind boggling how much rich natural resources there are. There is lumber there, they're in the Amazon rainforest, there are lowlands, and they can farm and raise any, grow anything that. Um, that they want to grow. Uh, it's great uh, cattle country. It's just amazing the natural resources and the potential that there is in the country of Bolivia. However, it's still one of the poorest countries in the world. Why is that? They lack the blessing of God. They lack the blessing of God. We are the country that we are because we were built upon a foundation. Okay, and we have this as our uh, 
our motto at, at Faith Baptist Church, built upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. That is our country. Okay? That is who we are as a nation. And, and the original settlers that came here came not as conquerors, not to get wealthy, but to come and to live and to farm and to create a home based upon biblical, um, a biblical foundation and biblical ideals. Okay? And I believe that that is what separates us from uh, any other country in the world is, is, is our foundation, not only why we are here, but also um, the, the principles that, 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 that have guided us through this almost 250 years. And so when I say that it, I believe that it is the greatest nation on earth, it's not just that, that it's where I'm from, okay? It's not just that I, am, I, I have a patriotic prejudice about my, about my homeland, right? About the, the mother country or something like that. I do believe that, th that this country has been blessed like no other country on the face of the earth. Okay? And, 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 and I believe that. The, the problem is that we're losing that. The problem is, and not, not, I'm not saying that we're losing our, our prosperity necessarily. I'm not saying that we're losing uh, just some, some element of our country. I'm saying that we're losing the foundation that we were built on. We're losing um, that, that um, God-fearing uh, perspective that we had. Okay, And so we need to be careful of that. This next Wednesday, we're going to have missionaries to Great Britain, the United Kingdom. Okay? There was a time when England was the leading sender of missionaries in the world. And now we are sending missionaries to them. And already, all right, um, there, are there are countries sending missionaries to the United States of America, okay? I think that we have lost, I, I'm, I, I, have, I, I didn't mean to, to touch on this this morning, so I didn't do any research, but I believe that if we haven't already been passed, we will soon be passed by South Korea as a leading sender of missionaries all over the world, okay? Um, my point is that don't get arrogant to think that we can't, that that can't happen to us. It is going to happen to us. And if you read or if you watch the news, and if you, if you notice what's going on in our country, we are fast going that direction. The, the same direction that, that Europe went, the same direction that the United Kingdom went and all of that. And, 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 and we are in a, in a, a free fall uh, at this point, okay? Uh, the United States of America, there is no nation in the world like the United States of America, a land where no matter who you are, where you came from, you can ascend to any position or title or economic status. You look at some of the richest, wealthiest people in this country, uh, they didn't necessarily inherit that. They didn't necessarily... Um, weren't given that their their status their 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 economic um, standing in this world is not because of who they are it's because of what they've done and be, because of the opportunity that was given to them because of living in this country even even at that if you take the standard of living of the of the people in the United States of America it is way beyond uh, many 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 of the countries uh, in this world okay um, and and so the, 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 the opportunity is limitless in this country, okay? Uh, in the United States of America, you are free to worship God as you understand Him or not at all, okay? Now, even though we may not agree with the way someone worships God or their, their belief in the Bible or their lack of belief in God or whatever, we still live in a country that allows us the freedom to decide recognizing that we are accountable, personally accountable unto God, right? The, the government cannot force us to, to be godly. No one can force us to be godly, 
Okay, that responsibility lies with us. You're free to travel from one end of this country freely without any documentation or question. Okay, at least you were before uh, the last year. I don't know if that's going to change or not. Okay, with only a sign to tell you that you're leaving or entering another state. Do you know that you can blow through um, the Montana-Wyoming border? Nobody will say anything to you. You can blow through the Wyoming-South Dakota border. Nobody will say, I mean, unless you literally blow through it and go too fast, they might stop you and say you're driving too fast. But that's not the way it is in many countries. In many countries, you have to stop and show your documentation and tell them where you're going and why you're going there and give them all kinds of things and maybe even be pressured to um, kick into the, to the, to the kitty for uh, whatever, right? Um, I know that firsthand. Okay? It's a great country that we live in. But you see, freedom is not free. Those men who signed that great document, the Declaration of Independence, did so at the risk of life and property. The freedoms that we enjoy, the freedoms that we take for granted, the, th the freedoms that we inherited because we were born in this nation were not free. They were bought at a high price. There were, there were many people who gave their lives, even the simple signing of the Declaration of Independence brought uh, destruction and, and peril to many of these men. Okay, uh, I, have, I have this list here. I'm not going to read necessarily all of it, but I'm going to read some of it. Um, five signers okay, were captured by the British as traitors and tortured before they died. Twelve had their homes ransacked and burned. Two lost their sons in the Revolutionary Army. Another two, uh, another had two sons captured. Nine of the 56 fought and died from wounds or hardships of the Revolutionary War. They signed and they pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. Okay, what kind of men were they? 24 were lawyers and jurists, 11 were merchants, 9 were farmers and large plantation owners, men of means, well educated, but they signed the Declaration of Independence knowing full well that the penalty would be death if they were captured. Carter Braxton of Virginia, a wealthy planter and trader, saw his ship swept from the seas by the British Navy. He sold his home and properties to pay his debt and died in rags. Thomas McKeem was so, was so hounded by the British that he was forced to move his family almost constantly. He served in Congress without pay, and his family was kept in hiding. His possessions were taken from him, and poverty was his reward. Vandals or soldiers or both looted the properties of Ellery, Clymer, Hall, Walton, Gwinnett, Hayward, Rutledge, and Middleton. At the Battle of Yorktown, Thomas Nelson Jr. noted that the British General Cornwallis had taken over the Nelson home for his headquarters. The owner quietly urged General George Washington to open fire. The home was destroyed and Nelson died bankrupt. Francis Lewis had his house and properties destroyed. The enemy jailed, uh, the enemy jailed his wife and she died within a few months. John Hart was driven from his wife's bedside as she was dying. Their 13 children fled for their lives. His fields and his grist mill were laid to waste. For more than a year, he lived in forests and caves, returning home to find his wife dead and his children vanished. A few weeks later, he died from exhaustion and a broken heart. Norris and Livingston suffered similar fates. Such were the stories and sacrifices of the American Revolution. These were not wild-eyed, wild-eyed, rabble-rousing ruffians. They were soft-spoken men of means and education. They had security, but they valued liberty more. Standing tall, straight, and unwavering, they pledged for the support of this declaration with the firm reliance on the protection of the divine providence. We mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Those are the men who signed the Declaration of Independence. That's what happened to them. That is the price that they paid so that we could wake up this morning and come to this church freely and without any, any questions. Why did these men risk so much to break away from England? Why did they risk going to war with arguably the greatest military power in the world at that time? 
Okay. The Declaration of Independence listed some 27 grievances against the King of England. For time, I'm not going to do that. But if, if you wanted to go back and look at that, they listed the grievances, why they were declaring their independence from the King of England, what he had done, what he had promised to do and had not fulfilled, and, and all of those things are spelled out in there. These grievances were so egregious that they felt, these men felt, that they had no other choice, okay? Uh, to buy this freedom, 6,800 men gave their lives in combat. Another 17,000 died of disease, most of which are prisoners, uh, which were prisoners of war. Freedom is not free. Freedom is not free. Though we inherit it as a free gift when we were born here, many paid the ultimate sacrifice so that we could inherit that freedom. Over time, however, we as people have forgotten the price that was paid for our freedom. And in many ways, we have forgotten the oppression that caused those men and really the whole country to stand up and say, enough, we're not going to put up with this any longer. Now, we have slowly and steadily traded in our freedom for security. These men gave up all security and traded it for freedom. But we have gone the other way. We have gone from a nation of people who are willing to give all of their possessions to buy their freedom to a nation of people who are willing to give their freedom to protect their possessions. Going back one step at a time to an oppressive government that requires we give up more and more of our freedoms and rights. Those who would give up essential freedom, Benjamin Franklin wrote, uh, those who would give up essential liberty, excuse me, to purchase a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. In our text this morning, Paul makes a statement that appears to fit exactly with what is happening in our country today. But he doesn't talk, he's not talking about the, the temporal life. He's not talking about um, uh, what's going on here in our secular society. He's talking of the spiritual. Okay? He's talking of our spiritual lives. The Galatians had come to Christ and had been set free from the bondage of sin and from the law. But now they were turning back. Why would they do that? Why would they turn back to sin? Why would they turn back to the bondage of the law? Why would they go back to those things? I think that there's a really interesting parallel between what was going on in the book of Galatians and what's going on in our country today. We can see as we turn back and we, we go back from this freedom that we've enjoyed and we rely more and more and more on the government and rely more and more and more on, on their protection and we, we, we almost gladly hand over freedom so that someone would take care of us. The same thing is referred to here really in, in, in Galatians chapter 5. Why would they do that? I think believe, be, uh, partly because they were confused. Okay, You say, well, what were those believers confused about? I think that they were, they were confused about how much of the law am I supposed to keep? What is supposed to go? And so there was a little bit of confusion there. And there were people who came in and said, no, you have to keep the law. You have to do this. And Paul is, 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 is encouraging them. He's exhorting them to not go back to the law, to continue on in the liberty that, that Christ has given us. Okay? They're also, they also were going back because it was familiar. It was just familiar territory. Familiar is easy no matter how hard it is. Have you ever noticed that? The familiar is easy no matter how hard it is. I look around uh, this world today and I see people in, in, in just terrible conditions. And I think, why in the world are they, do why are they doing that? 
Why don't they go get a job? Why don't they get off of drugs and alcohol? Why don't they, why don't they change their life? Why don't they get out of that mess? Why don't they, why don't they leave lodge grass and go somewhere and get a job? And, 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 and all of these, these thoughts go through my mind and it's finally come to the, to, to, I've finally come to the realization that, you know what? It's just easy, no matter how hard it is. It's just easy to stay doing what we've always done. It's just easy to not make any changes. It's just easy to continue on in the, in the, in the poverty and, the, and in the spiritual decay and, and all of that. It's, it's just easier to stay with the familiar than to make the changes necessary. And many of us look at them uh, that, are, that are struggling in that way and say, why in the world don't they, don't they change? Right? But we don't know what it's like. To be in that situation. But if we would look at our own lives, I think that we would notice, you know what, there's some things in my life that I ought to change. There's some things that I, in my life that I ought to do different. There's some things in my life that I, that I, you know, that I could get better. And, 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 and I'm sure that many people look at me and say, why doesn't he just do that? Well, it's just familiar. It's just easy. No matter how hard it makes my life, maybe it's just easy. Why do, why do they do that? Why do they turn back? Partly because they had forgotten. They had forgotten what was given so that they might be free. Just like in this country. Spiritually, we do the same thing. You see, salvation is not free. Although it is offered to us as a free gift, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ paid a terrible price for our salvation beaten, spit upon, ridiculed, scorned, and finally hung on the cross to die. Jesus Christ paid a terrible price so that you and I could be free. Free from sin, free from the bondage of the law, free from, free from the, the consequences of sin, and free from the corruption of sin. They forgot what was given and then they also forgot what they had been set free from. We, we forgot that uh, we had, or they forgot maybe that they had, had been set free from sin, that they'd been set free from the, the penalty of sin, from, from eternity in hell. And they'd forgotten these things. They'd forgotten that, that, that they had been forgiven of so much. And so they, all, of these, all of these things were, were kind of forgotten and they started to drift back to the old life, drift back to the law, drift back into their sin and to drift back into all things. And, and Paul comes here in verse one and says, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. We can go back into chapter one and get some more context. But basically, he was exhorting them to, to, to not go back to the law. Don't go back. Don't go back. Stand fast, stand firm. That, that, same, that same exhortation would fit in with our society today. Stand fast in the liberty by which we've been made free. Don't give up that liberty. Don't, give, don't turn that over. Don't, don't just, just lay down and die. Stand fast. Many people have given their lives for the freedoms that we enjoy and at the first sign of opposition, we just roll over and give up, right? Doesn't that sound like secular America? Doesn't this sound like American Christianity, Galatians chapter 5? In both the secular and the spiritual, there is a tendency to go back. In the secular, in this country, there's a tendency to forget how precious our freedoms are and give them back in order to be safe and secure. Look where we are today. Just in the last year and a half, look how our nation has changed. Look at how our freedoms have changed. Look at the way we view our freedoms. Right? Look at the way we view them. Even in light of the, the coronavirus, the masks, people wearing masks all the time. Now, I'm not going to get into the, a debate about whether masks work or they don't work. Okay? But look at our opinion of those. Look at, look at how uh, they're mandated and how we just, we just follow like sheep many times. Just because it's easier. Just because whatever. And, and, and 
the government was reluctant at first to tell us we had to wear masks and now it's just flipping oh i think you need to wear a mask boom <laughs> new law right our freedoms have been taken away shutdowns the shutdown that was supposed to last for two weeks to flatten the curve lasted for months and months and months i heard on on the radio the other day that uh I, i'm trying to remember if it was if it was great britain uh or if it was another country over there who said that they may never be able to open fully again. It's craziness. It's craziness. And there are people in this country who don't believe. They, I mean, now it was like they apologetically came to us and said, oh, please shut down please stay at home please you know do this for just a couple of weeks so that we can we can kind of handle the surge of the virus that comes through we just want to handle that and now we're to the point where we're saying no everybody has to stay home nobody can ever go out again nobody can ever get within six feet of another person again unless they're vaccinated um and and, and it's just going to be a new way of life look at the way our attitude about freedom has changed and now the, 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 the talk about vaccination passports where you have to have a, a card or however they're going to implement that. And, and you're going to show that so that you can travel and show that so that you can attend a, a, a function or a, or, or a concert or, a, or church or whatever the case may be. Look at the way all this stuff has come in. Look where we are with the church services Look where we are with unpopular speech. It came out this week that, that some of the newscasters are being, are being investigated like criminals. For Why? Because they have stood up and said what they believed. Right? It's amazing. The First Amendment to the Constitution says this, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise there, thereof. You see what that says? It says Congress shall make no law. That means that any law that's made to hinder our free exercise of religion is unconstitutional. We do not have to follow that law. It's against the Constitution. And the Constitution of the United States does not give us our rights. The Constitution of the United States protects our rights. These, consti the, these constitutional um, um, rights are not given. They're protected. Look where we are today with gun control. Okay? The Second Amendment says this, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state... The right of the people to keep them bare arms shall not be infringed. What is the purpose of the Second Amendment? Is it deer hunting? No, it's not deer hunting. And that's been the mantra of the NRA and many politicians for years and talking about, oh, uh, you know, you need to have a deer rifle and we can go out and hunt and we can do these things. Wait a minute. The Second Amendment's not about my deer rifle. The Second Amendment's about my AR, right? And about my tank, and about my whatever else, right? Whatever, it protects the right that we have, okay? Being necessary to the security of a free state. This is talking about as a people, guarding and, and protecting and preserving a free state. That's not talking about deer hunting, okay? Look at the way our attitudes have changed. When I was a, when I was a, a child, not very many years ago, okay, if I, wanted to, if I wanted to go to school with a .30-06 in the back window of my pickup, I could have done that and probably not even had to lock my doors. By the time I was in high school, I was not in lodge grass. If, <laughs> I could have hung that. If I would have been in lodge grass, I would have had to lock my doors, right? But... Um, no one would have said anything anywhere in the country. And there were no school shootings when I was in high school. You never heard of it, ever, ever. There were guns everywhere. There were guns everywhere, okay? The problem in this country is not guns. The problem in this country is the heart of the people, right? The heart of the people. But look, 
Now we are, are so concerned about our safety and our security that we would, we would drive to Billings in order to turn over our guns to the FBI. So, oh, please, please keep me safe. Please don't let anything hurt to me, happen to me. I'll give you my guns if you'll just keep me safe. Okay? That, was not, that was not the attitude of those men who signed the Declaration of Independence. Okay? Well, it's easy to see this tendency of people to go back in the secular. But what about in the spiritual? Many Christians who are saved out of alcoholism or drugs, or maybe our parents or our grandparents were saved out of alcoholism or drugs, uh, see no problem with social drinking. What's going on? Right? What's going on? We go back into the exact same thing that destroys families and destroys generations of, of, of people and makes children's lives miserable. Many Christians get saved and recognize that they owe their lives and their eternities to their Savior, but then slowly walk that back, finding all kinds of things to do instead of attend services, pulling out of different areas of service where they once served, promising God that they would go where He called them and then dropping out tithing and giving to their local church until either things got too tough or too good. Turning away from the world only to go back to it, to music, entertainment, to values. What am I living for? Am I living for a house, a car, horses, lands, 401ks? What are my values? Paul warns these Galatians, don't go back. Don't go back to that. Okay? And then Paul gives three exhortations. I'm going to mention them real quick, and then we're going to close down. Look at uh, chapter 5 and verse 13. The Bible says here, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, flesh but by love serve one another. We have a calling. Salvation, like our freedom, wasn't free. We're called unto liberty. Christ has freed us from the law. Christ has freed us from sin. And we're not saved by our works. We're saved by His work. Do not use this liberty as occasion to sin. Don't go back, Paul says. Keep moving on. Recognize that you've been called out of the law, out of works, unto liberty. Don't go back. And serve one another. Number two, notice the command, verse 16. The Bible says here, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall, shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. We touched on this in Sunday school this morning, how, Josh, or how Joseph nurtured his faith, how, how Joseph walked with God. And because Joseph was walking in God, he wasn't easily pulled off into some sin. He wasn't distracted and, and, and detoured into, into some sin because of of his walking in the spirit, he did not fulfill the lusts of his flesh. Okay? Are you walking in the spirit? Are you striving in the spirit? Do you struggle with some sin or temptation? Walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the, the, the lusts of the flesh. How do we combat the flesh? Walk in the Spirit. And then number 3, verse 17, notice that. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. The flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. There's a battle going on for control in your life. There's a battle going on for control in, in, in our lives, in the church. Do you sense that battle? Do you struggle with that battle? I struggle with that battle. I would say that if you're not struggling with that battle, then you're losing the battle. Who will win? The spirit or the flesh? How do I fight that battle? We fight that battle with God's word. We fight that battle with submission to God's commands. And we fight that battle by yielding to the spirit. Paul tells these Galatians, stand fast. Don't give in. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. And don't be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. 
Don't go back. Don't go back, Paul says. Instead of going back, go forward. How do we keep from sliding back? We go forward. Always forward. Keep pushing ahead. How do we move forward as a nation? How do we fight for this country that, that we've been given? I think the number one way that we can fight that battle is to get right with God and stay right with God and to stand fast in the liberty wherewith we have been made free. Okay? And be not tang entangled again with the yoke of bondage. And then, and then we can make a, a difference in the country that we live in. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for all that you've done for us. I thank you for your goodness and your grace. I thank you, Lord, for the country that we live in. I thank you for the freedom that we have. Lord, mainly the freedom that we have to be in this place today. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us. Help us to not take that for granted. Help us to not just glibly give that all back. Help us to stand. Help us to, to do what's right. Lord, I pray that you would just uh, use us today. Lord, guide and direct. Help us. Give us strength. Give us wisdom. Give us grace. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.